Good morning. When Tyler started talking about being a gym, I thought he was going to pull out a rag and buff me up a little bit. Um, thanks. That was uh, very nice, Tyler. Uh, I want to join Tyler uh, with my colleague and co-organizer, Sue, Susan uh, Hockfield, in welcoming everybody. We look forward to a wonderful day. It's a day that's uh, going to focus in many ways on uh, this term convergence, and I will get to that in a few moments as to what uh, I mean and we mean by that. Uh, but uh, just to briefly look through the agenda, we're going to subsequently have a keynote by Eric Lander. We seldom have a keynote, but Eric is such a convergent personality and uh, so uh, important to the field that uh, we thought that would be totally appropriate. Uh, then we're going to have uh, a new view that uh, looks at technology uh, and its impact on cell biology. Then we're going to do more network and computational activities showing the convergence of computation and the importance of computation in both uh, basic science as well as in uh, more tr translational activities. Uh, then I want to note a really exciting panel, uh, a panel on convergence in healthcare. It's the who's who of this sort of policy leadership community. And uh, uh, Susan Hockfield is going to chair that. And uh, please be sure and, uh, and listen to that because I think there's going to be some very profound ideas. I'm sure there will be. And then uh, we will turn to more materials, nano, and uh, ways of measuring and assaying things, and new technologies in a variety of uh, different settings. So this is a, a wonderful day of convergence. I want to thank the speakers and the panelists uh, for taking time out of their, their you know, busy days to come uh, to participate in this. Uh, just to define convergence, and uh, Bob Langer and I published an article, Perspective in, in Science, 10 years ago about uh, convergence, but more recently, uh, Tyler, Susan, and I uh, ran a, a national meeting, and then we re produced a report on, on this uh, activity, which we had a, an announcement at the National Academy. And uh, this is the way we sort of motivate convergence. Advances in information technology, material imaging, nanotechnology, optics, and quantum physics, coupled with advances in computing, modeling, and simulation, have already transformed physical science. We are now beginning to transform life science as well. And I think that sets in perspective where we are in life science, in terms of incorporation of the revolutions that have been going on in physical science, computational science, and other parts of the community. There has been a, a discourse, a vision, a gap between, in my opinion, engineering, physical science, computational science, and life science over the whole establishment of the molecular field. I want to think about the history. I'm an elderly spokesman these days, so I always want to think about the history. I, I want you to think that the whole field of molecular biology actually, I believe, came from Max Delbruck. Max uh, was a physicist in the 30s and 20s. He uh, was a, a member of the sort of intellectual quantum revolution and, and gravitational science and uh, Niels Bohr community. But he got interested in the stability of genes how genes could be transmitted, or phenotypes of genes could be transmitted. He didn't know what a gene was. Uh, through many, many uh, millennium. And uh, this fascinated him. He thought it might be new uh, principles of physics there. And he started, uh, it become, he became interested in the gene. And he, he understood as a physicist he needed the most simple system he could find to define a gene. And that led him to focusing on the phage. It led him to collaborations with Salvador Luria, uh, a biologist, Al Hershey, one of the first geneticists, molecular biologists, and the three of them uh, got the Nobel Prize for 
founding molecular biology. Out of this school came Jim Watson, who went to England, as you know, and participated with Francis Crick in the discovery of the structure of DNA. So we can trace our origins back to physics, but then we sort of left physics, and there's always been a few physicists contribute, but it's, it's been a field that's evolved with molecular uh, biology as its central theme over the last 60 or 70 years. And as we were thinking about this, we wanted to talk about the history of, of biological science. So we started talking about the first revolution, the structure of DNA, Watson and Crick, molecular biology, the genetic code, and then biotech, recombinant DNA that gave rise to being able to synthetically make genes and then create organisms with different traits. And we called that the first revolution in uh, biological science of the 20th century. And then the second revolution would be genomics and the whole high throughput, bringing technology into genes and nucleic acids and that also led to RNA as high throughput and, and proteomics and dealing with that data. And you'll realize as you listen today that that's where we're at now. This is where we're at in convergence of most of the technologies with life science. But the third revolution, the revolution in the 21st century, is a convergence of life science and integration of information technology, physical thinking and physical modeling, engineering, into life science and healthcare. And this is both going to transform our science and it's going to transform how we deliver healthcare and how we deliver challenges such as energy, food, environment, water, all the major issues that face our society in, in this uh, world with you know, billions of people. Uh, are going to need these technologies, this convergence of, of engineering and physical science with life science. So we, we made this interesting convergence time scale from uh, 1953 with the discovery of the structure of, of DNA. Uh, I will remind you that Watson went to Harvard to establish molecular biology at Harvard. And his mentor, Salvador Luria, who I just mentioned previously as a founder of molecular biology, came to MIT in the 50s and established molecular biology here at MIT. So you see Harvard and MIT making this bet in the 60s on genes. And then out of that came a lot of the activities that now are seen in Kendall Square and, and in revolutions of science across the country. In the 70s, the recombinant DNA Genentech was established in the 90s, the genome revolution started with the goal of sequencing the human genome. And then we're moving towards convergence of engineering and life science and physical science and computational science as we left the 20th century and entered the 21st century. Now, I genuinely believe that the problems of the 21st century, as I just mentioned, are going to require convergence science. But it's a little discouraging when you look what's happening in Washington. This is the NIH funding in terms of principal investigators who are in departments of bioengineering, engineering, physics, biophysics, biostatistics, and mathematics. 3.4% of the PIs supported by NIH come out of those disciplines. Uh, that means that there is, as I mentioned before, a gulf between these disciplines that are going to be transformative on our science and our community of uh, biomedical health research and fundamental biological research. And that gap is not being taken up by NSF, which basically funds a whole diversity of other life science activities, but not at a scale anything close to what NIH, our Department of Defense, or the Department of Energy. It's a major impediment to the development of this field. And I would argue that convergence is 
a major motivator for expanding support of life science, both at NIH as well as in other agencies, to make this welding between engineering physics and mathematics and life science real, where other disciplines can contribute to that future of convergence. So that's what I think about when I talk about convergence. But right now, I have the privilege of introducing a great convergence scientist, as I mentioned, Eric Lander. Eric, as you know, is the founding director of the Broad Institute, which is the most collaborative organized institute that I know. He is, has a history of convergence. He came out of Princeton, a Rhodes Scholar. And he went to Oxford, and his PhD was Algebraic Coding Theory and Symmetric Lock Designs. Now, I didn't read that thesis. <laughs> But I, <laughs> and I probably couldn't read that thesis, but <laughs> it would be, uh, it's, it's a convergent thesis, let's put it that way. His first position was in uh, managerial economics at the Harvard Business School. And then he got uh, infatuated with life science, uh, moved to the Whitehead Institute and to MIT in 1986. And then in 1990, he became uh, the director of the Center for Genomic Research at MIT and a major player in the Human Genome Project, as you know, and uh, a leader of that project in 2003 when they announced the completion of the Human Genome Sequencer. And he was a major motivator of that whole development in science. And I look forward to his keynote, 30 Years of Convergence. Eric, it's wonderful to have you. <laughs> 